You're listening to the Kingdom Project Podcast. These are discussions on biblical theology and interpretation. The emphasis is on context and grace. The goal is to promote biblical literacy by displacing and debunking most modern interpretations. The challenge is to engage in healthy conversation that may stretch, but sharpen iron. This is The Kingdom Project, and I'm your host, Marcus Hall. Okay, so um, I want to talk about hope, all right? So this will be probably one of the rare times you're going to hear me sort of be relevant. <laughs> and I, you know, if you know me, I, I like to just go verse by verse. So we go through books a lot of times or a topic. And uh, I was trying not, to, I was like, I'm trying not to get too sucked in to the current wave of what's going on. Uh, you know, so I, but I, I want to talk about hope because hope is something that we have, even if you don't feel like you have it, you have it, okay? And I'm going to explain that. So we do live in a culture where we have been trained or indoctrinated, if you will, right, by the media. And I'm not going to just be all on the media, but by the media, all right, by social media, all right, to grumble and to complain and to, to insist on having something that we do not have. And to focus on that instead of on the, all the things that we do have, right? The media, and it doesn't matter if it's left or if it's right. It, it's just, you know, I'm, I, I'm Republican, you know, but then I go right and I'm going to check out Fox News before I check out CNN. <laughs> but it doesn't matter if it's left or right. It doesn't. They can still have us thinking that all that's going on in the world or in our country today is nothing but a hopeless situation. And that's what you really start to get when you take in a lot of news. And people are sick of hearing it. They're sick of seeing it. They're sick of what's going on. And it just seems hopeless to a lot of people. So from the pandemic that's currently still impacting our lives to the protests, to the riots in the streets that are demanding the rewriting of our nation's history. Okay, it's all very unsettling. It's frustrating. And many feel hopeless. Uh, I don't think it's the end of the world. But it certainly is a time that our nation needs to uh, receive prayer. And they need to hear a biblical worldview instead of a secular worldview. All right? And... I've put out a couple of my podcasts in this time that we haven't been together. And my last one was about how there's a lot of people in the church that are taking the secular worldview to explain things that are going on. And they cannot give a biblical worldview on why black lives matter. They just take the narrative of black lives matter. Black lives matter because all men were created in the image of God, right? We show no partiality in this, but they're getting together and they're kneeling and they're apologizing for things in which they have not done. And it's a lot like uh, in the Old Testament, bowing, bowing or kneeling to Baal. Baal. And uh, you guys can check that out. It's online. I won't go there right now. But it's the new religion, it seems like, in America. And it's uh, upsetting. It's upsetting when you see the church talking about we need racial reconciliation but that reconciliation happened 2,000 years ago through Jesus Christ because God was in him reconciling the world to himself. They need to hear the gospel. They don't need to hear about di diversity training and things like that. Racism's real. I know it is. But everything else are man-made philosophies and they're full of empty deceit as Paul has put it in Colossians 2. So one of the first signs, I would say then, of a growing, maturing spirit in us as Christians is that we begin to give thanks to God for what he has poured out into our lives and then have hope despite the current situation. Okay, so in times like these, many can admit 
to having difficulties in growing in hope or having hope at all. So don't misunderstand me here. There are certainly times for concern and for worry. All right? We worry. We can become stressed. This is part of the human experience on planet Earth, okay? It's just part of it. Uh, I'm not going to take that narrative. I've heard some narrative of it's all dependent on us 100%. It seems to be one obstacle that God cannot get around, <laughs> is, it, 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 which is silly to me that if you feel hopeless or people that suffer from depression or anxiety, they have no hope. That's your problem. God can't take care of that until you do this and a quid pro quo type of thing. All right. But the, this is life in the world. So there is worry. There is concern. OK, but the thing I am pointing out today, because it's something I've been dealing with, is to remember who our God is and to remain in hope. Now, I'm not having problems with who God is. But his sovereignty is definitely a topic that I cannot comprehend fully. I'm not going to be able to understand his sovereignty completely. It's very complex. But he is a sovereign God. It's clear to see that when you read through his word. God is in control. But it's hard and it's stressful to be in this current situation with the virus, the mask. All right. I work with the public. I'm going to their homes. You know, at first it was gloves, so much sanitation, everything, just rubbing alcohol, spraying it all over, masks, just wear every, somebody sniffles, coughs, whatever, oh, they got COVID, you know, and you're freaking out. I have received the calls too. Hey, need to let you know you were at the house Friday and a coworker of mine has some in their family tested or may have coronavirus, you know? And so I'm part of this contact now, the contact tracing, waiting to hear what the test results are because if they had it, whether I was exposed or not, I'm going to be locked up for 14 days, you know? This is wears on your nerves on a daily basis when you're doing this. Uh, getting your temperature checked uh, at bigger corporations you know i went to a bank friday as soon as i walk in they're like sir please step on the blue circle it's in the corner face the corner take off your mask they had to take my picture this is part of their contact tracing and take their take my picture then sanitize in front of them take my temperature sign my name and my phone number and this is what we're going through right now okay it's like ugh. so it I'm not coming against being nervous or having worry. I'm talking about remaining in hope, okay? And there's a proverb in Proverbs chapter 13, 12. It says that a hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Okay, this is a proverb. These are just short little sayings, all right? This is great wisdom. Not everything is 100% in there like do this a, B, and C, and you'll get this. But I want to look at a hope deferred. And what does that mean? Does it, do we know the definition of deferred? It means to put off or drag out. All right? It's a long, drawn-out process. It looks like many things. All right? Long-term battles with a sickness or cancer. A heartbreak of a miscarriage, even waiting to get out of a state mandate shut in or shelter in place to return to church and to return to fellowship and normal life. Right. The word heart here isn't just the mental and emotional core of a person either. It's speaking of the whole inward person that when something makes the heart sick it causes despair and it causes affliction. There's another translation that reads, when hope is crushed, the heart is crushed. So hope deferred builds upon stress and anxiety and depression and all these things. And when we wait for a good thing for so long that the desire and the expectation can turn to hopelessness. We can, in fact, start to feel ourselves spiritually drying up in these times. And when that starts to happen, we become vulnerable. 
All right, but this proverb, all right, it does, it, it's not done, right? Because the second half gives the antithesis of hope deferred. But a long, a longing fulfill, uh, a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. So the tree of life represents the renewal of life. That when prayers are answered, we are encouraged. When we survive an illness, we rejoice. That uh, obtaining the good thing that we have longed for allows for a reviving of the soul, right? Later in verse 19, Solomon will state that a, a longing fulfilled is sweet to the soul. So what is the main hope? That's the question. What is hope? What's the main hope that we should always have, that we do have, and, and, and a hope that is lasting, that can never be deferred? What is that, right? I would suggest that we put this in the category of grace and mercy, right? And with faith. Faith, faith really isn't something that we can really muster up. God, it's a gift from God. Because he has called us and when he calls us, he's saved us and he's justified us and then glorified us. And Paul speaks of these things in the past tense. All right. Psalm 39, 7 asks the Lord where to put one's hope and it ends saying that my only hope is in you. So our only hope is in Christ. We look to Christ in placing our hope in Christ alone then we're surely not going to be disappointed. For Christ is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. And that's in Hebrews 6, 19. But where does the hope come from? Right? Am I one that can just simply tell you guys to conjure up some hope and it's all going to be good? No. No. (laughs) My wife would tell you, no. 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 I'm sorry, but I can't. And although and I've been a little relevant up to this point, all right, it's about all I can muster up to be on that type of teacher, all right? But the, the preacher and the teacher I can be and am is one that's going to turn to God's word to give you something that's even more relevant than any news report that's happening today. In Romans 15, verse 13, Paul's writing to the Romans. And he says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. All right. So here it is. Where does hope come from? We just receive the answer. It's okay. It's cool. It's cool. It's all right. Where does hope come from? Right. The God of hope. God. Right. This means that God is the origin. He is the object of hope. And that phrase in believing, it says peace in believing. That phrase. That uh, it's the key. It's the key to hope that our life first must be a life of faith. And from our faith comes this hope. You'll move up if you're in there following in 15, Romans 15, verse 4. It says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Now we get a second piece here. I know I backed up, but I want to focus God first, <laughs> right? Verse 13, we see that hope comes from God and then it's attributed to the Holy Spirit when we are bound in that hope. In verse 4, we, it's attributed to the Word of God, our Bibles that we have. So hope comes as the Holy Spirit enlightens believers to understand and trust the God of the Bible. So as we focus on the Lord through the scriptures, our faith grows and our faith in God gives us hope. And he's the author of it all. He's the one doing this and working and empowering us. So it seems very like this is the key. It seems very simplistic, right? God has 
called us. He's given us faith. And through that faith alone in Christ, we are forgiven. We are placed in Christ. And then God continues to work in us by giving us hope. And then we grow in that hope through the word and through the Holy Spirit empowers us to abound in that hope. Why? Right? Why? Because our God is our Father and He is good. God is good, right? So when we can't see the big picture, too often we don't see things as good, do we? Nope. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so I'm preaching to myself. <laughs> this was for me. But if we understand that our God is good, He's good all the time. Everything that's happening is happening. Why? I don't know all the time. I don't have all the answers. I just said I can't comprehend sovereignty. (laughs) Not to the point of the way God is sovereign. But we have to understand that God is good all the time. His goodness is good. And when we understand that, we learn to trust Him in every situation in our lives and what's going on. And that the goodness, the goodness of God is that essential perfection, okay? It's essential perfection of the divine nature, which inclines Him to deal bountifully with His creatures, which is us. The biblical concept of God's goodness focuses on these concrete experiences of what God has done and what he is doing in the lives of his people. And scripture affirms that God is good and he does good. It's over and over again, but here's a few. Psalms 100 uh, verse 5, For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Psalms 130, or yeah, 135, verse 3, it says, Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. Psalms 145, verse 9, The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All of it. Then in Exodus 34, uh, verse 6, and the Lord's passing by Moses, and it it, it says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Now, I've already mentioned sovereignty. I'll just add it again that this all deals with God being sovereign as well. We're just not opening that can of worms today. All right? But he is sovereign. But if we had to narrow it down to one quality to which goodness points, it would be that quality of generosity from our Father. That generosity means a disposition to give to others in a way which has no mercenary motive whatsoever. And it is not limited by what the recipients deserve. But it consistently goes beyond it all the time. It's part of the gospel through Christ and his death and his resurrection. That generosity expresses the simple wish that others should have what they need. And God gives hope because he is good. So we ought not let circumstances discourage us. Because God is in control. He's got it. We say this a lot, right? God's got it. Do we actually know what we mean when we say he's got it? He has it. He's in control. If we look at life from the human viewpoint, all right? As humans, even as Christians, or the secular viewpoint, if we look at life from that viewpoint, we will have nothing but sorrow and hopelessness. But if you look at life from the divine viewpoint that you can rest in God's sovereign care, then you can rest in it. You'll have hope because this kingdom rules over all. It may not look like it sometimes, but it does. 
All right. So when you read, even in the New Testament, when you read through Scripture, you find people that all had something in common. All right. The man who lay for 38 years beside a pool who was convinced that it was useless to have hope for a miracle. A disabled man sat in front of the temple gate day after day begging for money when what he really wanted was to be healed. Lazarus died thinking that his best friend wasn't there to comfort him in that time. And Martha thought that God waited too long to show up and now her brother's dead. There's the woman at the well who searched for love, led her through a whole series of failed relationships. And then you have Peter, right, who made mistake upon mistake. Peter gets beat up a lot, I think, but (laughs) uh, I don't want to do that. But he did make a lot of mistakes. And then in the moment of weakness, he deserts the one whom he loved more than any other. And he had even been told that he would do it. And they all have one thing in common. They all had reached the point of being hopeless and then they had an unexpected encounter with the power of God. And it changed their life. So many of us have been overwhelmed. I'll get back to being relevant. Many of us have been overwhelmed by hopelessness. And not just in this period in the last few months. There's times we have felt this. That we can all agree on that we've been here but we have also all that are here right now have been made new new creations through the power of god because of christ through christ right he has transformed us he is renewing our minds so there's always ground for hope and we need the hope that's been spoken of today in order for us to continue with our lives because without hope We see the world as a pessimist, all right? But with the biblical hope, we can rise above that because of the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, through him, even when we think that the situation is entirely hopeless. And notice I said biblical hope, because that's what it is. It's biblical hope. It's not hope in general. It's not a, I hope things will work out okay. It's not wishful thinking. It's not even a being determined to, to strive for a positive mental outlook. Right? I'm not going to give you a series on positive thinking. Because we're in Christ. He's in us. We stay focused on his word. We're empowered then by the Holy Spirit to grow and mature and be transformed. The hope of those who rise above hopelessness then is found in the very specific hope that's found only in Christ. And that's it. It's all Christ. It's all Jesus. This is the hope that endures the test of all times, all ages, and it transforms lives. So our lives, they must first be the life of faith. And from our faith then comes hope. And that's what manifests. Because our God is the God of hope, so we trust Him because He is good.